sepsis is still the most common avoidable cause of death in children in the UK. Sepsis is, is common, sepsis kills, and it's one thing that we are always, always worried about. Sepsis means sepsis. When I think of sepsis, I think of a very sick child who's got an infection, and it might be bacterial or it might be viral. Sepsis is a really scary word if you've got somebody complicated in the family. Sepsis is my responsibility. Hello and welcome to our Paediatric Sepsis podcast series, brought to you by the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health and the team from the Great North Children's Hospital with guest speakers from all over the country. My name is Emma Lim and I'm a general paediatric consultant at the Great North Children's Hospital. And I'm Monica Parker. I'm a teaching fellow and junior doctor at the Great North Children's Hospital up in Newcastle. What we're going to be covering today is why we wrote this, why we think this is really important, what this whole series will cover and the content, a bit about sepsis, spotting it, managing it, and your responsibilities for sick children and remembering that you're not alone. So, should we start with why and what? I guess the thing that I always think about is that sepsis is still the most common avoidable cause of death in children in the UK. And that surprises me. But it shouldn't surprise me because it's complex, it's hard to recognise and it can be really difficult to treat. We've all been on call and thought at one time that that could be me. And that's the reason that we wanted to write this series of podcasts. So often on call or on the front line, we're too busy, there's too many patients, we're too tired, we're too hungry, sometimes we're too embarrassed, or the right person isn't there to ask. Learning how to recognise a sick child is a skill, and it's not easy, and we hope to share some of our insights from junior doctors, consultants, specialists, and from parents, and just to talk about how it feels and what we want. We want to be asking people, what is sepsis? What does that word mean? Emma, to you, what is sepsis? What does that word mean to you? Thanks, Monica. It's actually a really good question, and there isn't one simple answer. So, children get infections all the time. And what happens when they get an infection? They get immune response to that infection. And sometimes it's like a runaway train. That immune response just goes out of control. And instead of just attacking the bug the immune response actually starts to injure your own body. And that gives you multi-organ failure. So that could be respiratory failure, renal failure, cardiac failure, low blood pressure, all the symptoms that you see. And I'm learning that rapidly as a junior doctor on the wards, picking up what's abnormal and what's normal, when to be worried and when not to be worried. And oftentimes it's about looking at the child and eyeballing them and seeing whether or not they look unwell or not. And that's a skill that needs to be learned. And I think that's so true. And parents who see their children all the time often know their children's unwell before we can and before the observations and blood pressure and heart rate get abnormal. So going back to what's sepsis, the other thing to remember is that actually what is so different in paediatrics is we see a huge number of children with fever. So 30% of all the children who come to the paediatric ED department have fever. This is just like an incredible amount. I think our record was 40 in a day. And of all those children, only 10% have a serious bacterial infection, like a chest infection or a urinary infection, and only 1% has sepsis. So actually, it really is like looking for a needle in a haystack And this is especially hard because early sepsis looks just like an infection because you've got to have an infection to start with. So they all look the same, miserable, lethargic, crying, hot. And it's really difficult to predict which of those children with that infection are going to become septic and which will be able to fight it on their own. That's exactly right, Monica. So, Monica... Um, I'm a bit tired and you're even more tired and I know we work the weekend together and you're still working your 10-hour shift so how many was that in a row? I think this is my sixth today in a row. (laughs) And I want to ask you 
How does it actually feel when you're in that situation, when you see a child with a temperature? What's kind of running through your mind? How does it feel to be sitting behind the desk working your way through that pile of referrals as a junior doctor? I guess the thing is, when children get temperatures, I'm rapidly learning that whether that be due to a virus or a bacterial infection, children with temperatures just look rubbish. They look sick, they're irritable, they're upset, and parents get really worried. And because of that, it can be really hard to differentiate between the ones that are really sick and the ones that are just having a bad time with a temperature. And that's so true. And I think you have to remember that it's actually down to good basics. And the basics are being triaged really well. So taking a set of observations that includes their heart rate, their blood pressure, their oxygen saturation, thinking about parental concern, and filling in like a sepsis triage or protocol, which we have in our hospital. And I think as well, just being aware of the entire situation, being able to eyeball the waiting room and looking out for that child that just looks a bit sicker than the others. I have a a rule of thumb. If a child is screaming and crying, I know they're fine. (laughs) If a child is there lying, floppy, not wanting to take any fluid, lying in mum's arms, not really responding, that's when I get a little bit twitched. Yeah, I always worry about the quiet ones. It's the quiet ones you have to look out for. So, Monica, you were telling us about this child who came in who was so unwell. And I know you did the right thing. Tell me what happened. So I was seeing another child across the way, and this little girl was wheeled in um, by some of the nurses, and one of the more senior sisters just looked a bit concerned, and I I heard her um, scurry away and somebody mutter, can somebody call the registrar? And I knew my registrar was busy on the other side of the ward. So I just went across to see this child, and just from looking at her from the end of the bed, she looked rubbish she was floppy and pale and not responding and when we did a set of obs on her her blood pressure was 50 systolic and her sats were 75 so we put her on some oxygen and we straight away managed to get a cannula in her um, and we started a fluid bolus and we we got around into recess and we gave her some antibiotics and within 20 minutes or so she was opening her eyes she was reacting and um, I saw her yesterday on the ward and she's still not very well But it was the first time since I started working in paediatrics, which has only been about a year now, but it was the first time that I'd looked at a child, acted, and then felt like I'd actually saved a life. And I think for me, um, that was really powerful. And that is something that I want other juniors to be able to to have and to recognise. And hopefully these podcasts will help you to do that. These things stay with you. They stay with you for your life. And I guess that's the good bit of our job when it goes right. And I think the big thing about that day was just how, just how well that the team on that night worked together. So I'd started the initial management. My registrar was there within a few minutes. Um, but the senior sisters, the nursing staff who were drawing up the drugs, the A&E registrar who kindly came round to help while I tried to put a cannula in by holding the child's arm the on-call radiographer who came round within minutes to do a chest x-ray. Everybody just worked together so seamlessly and I was just really impressed by the entire team that night. Yeah, I secretly love being in recess. It's so satisfying because everybody just comes and does everything really quickly. And all those kind of... All those things that are so slow and frustrating about the hospital melt away because in an emergency we all pull together. And that's the scary thing. It's being able to detect them before it gets that bad. I had to go and speak to that little girl's dad yesterday just because he was so worried about how quickly she'd become unwell. And he was asking me, should I have done anything different? Did I do anything wrong? How can I predict this from happening again? We've seen this time and time again. We've seen children who went to their GP and within 12 hours were dead at home. So I think that that catching them in that little window where... They have not yet gone into septic shock is so important. And I guess that brings me to this question about why is it so important to recognise sepsis early? It's this horrible balance between it's really hard to spot sepsis early, but if you spot it early, you can treat it really quickly, like you did. Give antibiotics, give some fluid, and they'll get better. When sepsis is full-blown and they're really unwell, it's easy to spot because they look 
very, very unwell, but it's really hard to treat. And they end up in intensive care with all the complications and morbidity that that entails. Parents often ask me, how do I know if my child is getting worse? And how do I know if it's sepsis as opposed to an ordinary infection? And all the families I've talked to have this one thing that they say to me time and time again. They say, I knew that this illness was in some way different from other illnesses they'd had before. So most parents, their children have had coughs and colds and multiple viral infections. They have a kind of idea what it looks like. And they all say to me, I knew something was different this time. That's why I've come to you. And I find it's quite a useful question. I do ask a lot of parents, does this seem like an infection they've had before? I think, and if they say yes, this looks like they're the viral infections and I'm not worried, that reassures me as well. And actually, if they say no, something is different this time and I'm really worried, I take that very seriously. And especially with the babies, I might admit them simply because the parents say they're worried and it feels different. And one of the questions that her father asked me was, you know, she'd been to the doctors, she was given antibiotics, she seemed okay. And then within hours, she deteriorated that fast. And one question he had for me was, in all honesty, could she have died? I said, you know, she wasn't very well when she came in. And an hour later, yes, she, she, she maybe could have died. What do you think, Emma? Do you, would you agree with that? Absolutely. Children die from sepsis. There's a really good evidence that speed is important. So doing things quickly is important. And we haven't had that evidence till quite recently. And there was a paper in JAMA in 2018 from Idris Evans. And they looked, this was in New York State, and they looked at 1,179 pediatric patients. And they were seeing if you could deliver a bundle of care for sepsis in one hour. So that included fluids, antibiotics, blood cultures. If you could do that in one hour, the in-hospital mortality was 7%. If it took you four hours, the in-hospital mortality doubled to 15%. That's insane. Yeah. It's really, the odds ratio is 0.59. So there is good evidence that when you see these children, if you can recognise them and treat them within that one hour, you are going to save them from dying but the thing is it's so hard to do it all so fast um there's a lot of things that you get worried about um do you or do you not cannulate do you do you not do bloods it's really hard to see a child with a temperature and decide who you're going to prod with a needle who you're going to subject to the radiation who you're going to do an lp in and which ones you can get away with not doing that in and making that prediction and doing those things within the hour can be so difficult I guess the first thing is who gets investigations. And we can't forget that blood tests are invasive, they hurt, they upset children, they upset parents. And we don't really want to do unnecessary tests. And I guess this is a really difficult thing about picking out which ones need tests and which ones don't. And that probably is this really simple thing. It's asking for advice, getting a senior, getting a second opinion, getting somebody else to look at that child with you. Follow the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health on Twitter at RCPCHTweets or check out the hashtag, hashtag PeteRocks. So the other thing I always think about is antibiotic stewardship. If we gave antibiotics to all the children, like all those 22 you see in one evening, the amount of resistance that we would then end up with would be huge all those unnecessary antibiotics just to make us feel safe. So we have to be discriminatory. We have to decide who's got a virus and who hasn't. And that's actually really difficult because there are no tests at the moment that can tell you the difference between early sepsis and a bacterial infection and a simple viral infection. So that's the thing that we're always looking for. And I guess that brings me to this other thing. You know, I've been doing paediatrics for many, many years. And I still, when I see those children, I just have this one big thing in my mind and it's always, am I going to get a cannula in? Am I going to get IV access? Even now. And 
you always think, oh, well, if I don't get a cannula, then I can't give fluid, I can't do this. And you just have to stop and think. And now, if I don't get a cannula in, in two goes, I just put an intraosseous needle in. And once you've done that, you can take bone marrow and you can check electrolytes and cross match. Hot tip here. Don't put the bone marrow aspirate through the blood gas machine because it just clogs it up and everybody shouts at you. But with an IO needle in, you've got some bone marrow, you've done some tests, and you can safely give antibiotics, fluids, and even inotropes. Day saved. Oh, second hot tip. And this is so simple. Try before you buy. We so rarely use intraosseous needles that when you actually need to do it, you pull it out of the packet and you can't even fit it onto the gun. And then when you've done that, you don't know how to take the top off and you don't know how to tape it or stabilise it. And then you haven't worked out which connection fits. And that's so stressful in an emergency scenario. So go to one of your simulation fellows or practice with an old one because they do cost £80 per needle. But just literally taking it out, having a fiddle, seeing how they work before you need it is so worthwhile. Yeah, that's a good tip. I'll have to go and have a I'll have to go and have a go. Just don't practice on my leg. <laughs> So I guess my big heart sink as a junior doctor on the ward is, is pretty much the same. So I get worried about not getting a cannula in. Um, and the main thing for me is when to ask for help with IV access. Um, I've not been doing peds for that long. And sometimes you get a little bit worried about asking for help with a cannula because people assume that you can do them. And occasionally you'll get a bit of an eye roll from someone when you ask for help with a cannula. But sometimes all it takes is a fresh pair of eyes. And so never be scared to ask for help. Yeah, it's so true. I think after two goes, it's just not your day. And there's something about cannulas and little babies that it's a mindset. It's totally positive mental attitude. If you can, take a few big breaths to yourself before and say to yourself, this is just going to go in fine. And if it doesn't go in, I know a really nice person who can help me. It actually makes your day and the patient's day and the nurse's day so much easier. And I think that the answer to that is take a friend, have a nurse there with you, because you can't focus on doing one job and look at the patient. You do need somebody else there with you. And our nursing colleagues are so invaluable to helping um, with these difficult procedures. Yeah, they always tape it in better than I do. <laughs> Way better than I do. So your heart sink is cannulas as well as mine. Is there anything else? I guess the big thing is... So I saw 22 children on Sunday evening. Do I ask for help with every single one of those children? And I think the answer is simply, if you need help, you need help. If you're worried, you're worried. And I guess a lot of juniors get a little bit worried about asking for help, especially if it feels like you're asking for help for every single patient you're seeing. But at the end of the day, that's why your seniors are there. And that's the right thing to do if you feel like you need it. You just have to remember that you're not alone. And I guess the thing I like about sepsis is when I recognise a child is really sick, I can call on the team. And I know, I know that they're just going to drop everything and be there for me. Uh, they have my back and we're all working together and we are so slick as a team because we practice this. This is what we do. And it takes the whole team. It takes the person who starts the clock, the person who scribes, like the medical student tagging along to keep track of what we've given and when. It takes the nurses who make up all the infusions and check all the doses. And they're like your safety barrier because they can stand back and do all that checking. And it takes somebody else to be the eyes and oversee and look at the whole situation and think, what is the next step? Where are we going? And really importantly, it takes somebody to talk to the parents and just tell them that everyone is working for their child and that as soon as we can, we'll explain properly what's going on. And the parents really appreciate that so much. One of the things that's come out in some of our research is parents know that you have to do things in a hurry, but they just like a little bit of communication if you can tell them what to expect. If you can say they're looking after your child, they're really sick, and as soon as they're free, they'll talk to you. That's all they need to know. And oftentimes, as the junior member of the team, that will be me. Absolutely. My message is, you can always ask for help. 
you can always send them away, but you can always ask. So people get scared about ringing 222 or putting out a crash call. But actually, if you're on the other end of the crash call, you run there. And if you get there and somebody says, well, I don't need all of you, I just need two of you. I'm delighted to be sent away. And I never feel bad about going and being sent away. So you need to ask for help early. Remember, you are a team, you're not alone, and you can make a difference as a team. I don't think I've ever asked for help and never been met with a supportive response, even if a senior's gotten there and the child has actually been fine. So I'm lucky, I'm fortunate in that I've had some very supportive seniors that everybody's always been there for me when I've needed support support with a sick child. Um, I know that that's probably not always the case, but no one should ever feel scared to ask for help. No, nobody should ever feel scared to ask for help because your responsibility is to that child. And I guess however hard it is, you have to keep that child in your mind and do the best for that child. And if that child needs more help, they need more help. It makes me think about my responsibility. And I guess the reason I did these podcasts is because I think of things that have happened to children I've cared for in the past. Um, I think about children who've come in who it's been too late for. And I will never forget a child who came in, and it was very similar to a child that used, they went to see their GP, their GP saw them, thought that they might have a chest infection or flu, sent them home with really reasonable advice, and the next morning she just didn't look well. She looked really unwell, she was blue, she was cold, her mother rang 999, and the ambulance came, and the ambulance came, and her mother said to me, and the ambulance came, and she was dying in my arms. She just died in my arms at home. And she came in, and it was too late. And um, the parents, uh, we helped the parents. We sat with them and talked to them. And they asked me to tell her sister what had happened. So her sister had gone to school that morning, and she had a sister. And now they were going to have to bring her out of school, and I was going to tell her she no longer had a sister. And she walked towards me in her like uniform, just like my own children. And it was just awful. So I feel like my responsibility to these children who I couldn't help is to keep sending this message out about what you can do to prevent that kind of scenario because it's just devastating to families. So we hope by the end of this series that you'll feel confident to recognise and manage children with sepsis and that you won't hesitate to call for help because you need to remember that sepsis kills and that you have it in your power to save a life every day that you see these kind of children. Thank you, Monica. That's been really nice to talk to you outside of work. <laughs> it's like we never sit down <laughs> at work um, and I owe you a bag of crisps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been really nice to sit down and reflect on what we do every day day in day out because I think you can get lost in the busyness and the tiredness and the stress and it's really nice to sit back and hear these stories about how you've done a great job and I know you're a great doctor and it's really nice to actually think about that and reflect on how you could have saved a life. The Paediatric Sepsis podcast series was brought to you by the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health and Medisense, with support from Health Education England.